in the previous video, I went through different methods of meshing a simple pipe bend. In this video, I'm going to be extending the ideas from the previous video to show you how you can mesh the transition between a pipe or a piece of ductwork and a much larger domain. I'm going to be showing you structured and unstructured approaches for addressing this problem and actually go through many of the nuances in the approaches that can make a significant difference between a bad mesh and a really good quality mesh. So I'm sure that regardless of what meshing approach you typically take for internal flow problems, the nuances that I go through in this talk are going to be really useful for you. The meshing software I'm using in this talk is going to be Answer by Beta CAE Systems. Uh, this video isn't sponsored by Beta CAE Systems. The reason I'm showing you the meshes with Answer is Answer is the software that I use typically on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a really good piece of software and it allows me to show you all of the different meshing approaches and all of the different nuances in this particular meshing problem. So I want to thank Beta CE Systems for providing me with a license for Answer so that I can bring you this video, but the video isn't sponsored by them uh, at all. These are purely my own uh, thoughts and ideas when it comes to meshing. Right, with the introduction done, let's jump in and first start by looking at a structured meshing approach that we can use to mesh this simple transition between a pipe and a much larger domain. So before we start looking at the different meshing approaches, let's just start by having a quick look at the geometry. The geometry I'm considering is a cylindrical pipe or duct connected to a section of a much larger domain. I want you to imagine that this cuboid shaped block represents a piece of a much larger domain that maybe extends in this direction and has some more complicated components and features down here. What I'm going to be showing you and what I'm interested in in this talk is how the mesh transitions from this much larger domain into the duct or pipe here. And this duct or pipe could represent an inlet or an outlet to the domain, it doesn't really matter. What I'm interested in is the transition in the mesh here. Now, of course, this is quite a simple geometry and there are many different meshing approaches that you could use to approach this. And in practice, the meshing approach that you use would probably be dictated by the limits of the software that you're using and by the nature of the domain itself that extends beyond the cylindrical block. If you have quite a complex domain, you're probably gonna use an unstructured approach Whereas if you have a simple domain, you can probably get away with a structured approach. But in this talk, I'm going to be covering all of these features and actually just focusing on the transition between the large domain and the duct or pipe. Right, with that introduction done, let's jump in and start by looking at a block structured approach first. Now, a typical block structured approach will result in a mesh that looks something like this. And what you'll notice is that the mesh is entirely filled with hexahedral cells only, and we have this characteristic shape using O-grids to surround the cylindrical pipe. You can see we have a cylindrical O-grid through the length of the pipe, and we've also got an O-grid around the pipe at the base. And what this O-grid allows us to do is to refine the cells normal to the wall so that we can get that increased refinement that we want for the boundary layers on the wall of the pipe. And we've also got a refinement towards the top surface here of our domain section. So again, this is another wall on the top surface and the increased refinement there is allowing us to capture the boundary layers on this section of the domain as well. So this, this particular meshing, meshing approach is something that you may have seen before and People often think that this particular meshing approach is the optimum or the best way of meshing geometries. And that's often attributed to using entirely hexahedral cells. But just from looking at what we have here, that's not the entire picture. And actually we can't attribute this mesh to being the best way of meshing this geometry without looking at the mesh structure inside. And that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm going to start by just turning on the blocking edges so that you can really see what's being, what's being done here to create this hexahedral mesh. You can see that there's the classic O-grid structure here where the edges are offset from the surface and then the O-grid is passed all the way through the domain 
from the pipe here all the way down into the bulk of our domain. And of course, we'd only be able to use this approach if the remainder of our domain was sufficiently simple that we could use this block structured approach. So there are the blocks, and you can see we've got an O-grid again around the outside of the cylinder, which allows those cells to grow away from the cylinder. But if we turn on the mesh, and rather than looking at the blocks, if we now take a slice through the domain, we can see the problem with this approach. Now, at first glance, this meshing approach looks really good from the cross section. Again, we've got the increased resolution towards the wall, the top surface of our domain there, and we've got increased resolution towards the walls of our pipe as well. And if we look, all of the cells in this slice through the domain are orthogonal to each other. They're at right angles to each other. And so that would tell us that our non-orthogonal correction is not going to be used, at least in this plane, for these cells. So the cells are gonna have very high quality. And if you read this mesh into your, um, your CFD program, the number of poor quality cells would be very low and the mesh would appear to have very high quality. But the problem with this approach actually comes in with the blocking structure. And what I want you to do is I want you to focus on the very thin cells that are attached to the wall of the cylinder here. When these cells come down, because the blocking structure passes all the way through the domain, you can see that those high aspect ratio cells pass into the bulk of the flow and go all the way down until they hit the bottom wall of the domain. And we have the same issue here at the top surface as well. The high aspect ratio cells that are on the top surface of our domain pass across the aperture of the pipe itself. Now, what problem does this cause? In order to understand this, we actually have to think about what the flow is physically going to do in this particular domain. And what's going to happen is, if this is an inlet or an outlet to the domain, we know that the flow is going to be going either up or down through this aperture, and then the flow is going to be turning the corner as well. So what that's telling us is that the flow is going to be going normal to the thin axis of those high aspect ratio cells that you can see here. As the flow comes across, it's normal to the thin axis. And also, when the flow is coming here into the aperture of the pipe, the flow will be going at an angle, but again, towards the thin axis of the cell. This isn't a problem on the side walls of the cylinder and on the top walls of our domain, because we know there the flow is very slowly moving because of the no slip condition and the flow will be moving parallel with the wall because it can't go through the wall. But that's not the case for these high aspect ratio cells in the bulk of the flow. And the layers I've used here are actually fairly large. If you had a very, very deep boundary layer because you have uh, a very high Reynolds number flow, these high aspect ratio cells could be really thin and you may have cells with aspect ratios up to or even higher than a thousand. But why do the high aspect ratio cells create a problem here in the bulk of the flow, but not at the wall? Now, I've been through this in detail in a previous video on aspect ratio, and I highly recommend you go back through and look through that video. But in, in essence, the quick and short story is, of course, for a transient flow, uh, we're going to have to reduce the time step so that the flow only goes across a fraction of each of the cells in one time step. And because these cells are really, really thin, we're going to have to use a really, really small time step to make sure that the flow doesn't pass through more than one cell as it's going across the aperture here and across here. And for steady flow problems as well, these high aspect ratio cells are going to affect <coughs> the matrix coefficients in the uh, pressure or pressure correction equations as well. So this, mesh, this meshing approach as a whole, even though it looks very good, it may have very high cell quality metrics when we read this mesh into the CFD code. This isn't actually the best approach for meshing this geometry. And without moving to an unstructured approach, we can actually make some small tweaks to this blocking structure, which is gonna get away from this problem of the high aspect ratio cells in the bulk of the flow.
And after watching this video, if you use a block structured approach, I highly recommend you go ahead for yourself and look and see have you got this problem of high aspect ratio trailing cells off into the bulk of the flow. But for now, let's look in at a different blocking approach that we can use for this geometry. Now, I want to quickly show you the first way that some people use to overcome this problem of getting the high aspect ratio cells in the bulk of the domain. For this first method, unfortunately, I can't use a cylindrical pipe to show you because it doesn't work for this example. So I'm showing you with a square pipe instead. And even though this isn't a cylinder, I think you'll find the understanding really useful. So I'm just going to press ahead with the square cylinder for this example. Now, at first glance, this meshing approach looks very similar to the one we used for the cylindrical pipe on the last example. We've got the increased resolution normal to the wall at the top of the domain, and then we're using an O-grid type approach to get the uh, increased resolution normal to the wall. But once again, in order to assess this approach and see how it's different, we need to first turn on the blocking structure to look at it, and then have a look through the cross section of the mesh to see how it differs. So let's turn on the blocking structure. And the difference in between this blocking structure and the previous blocking structure is actually to do with the O-grid itself. And you'll remember for the first example, what we did was we just passed that O-grid all the way through the domain. So we started it at the top, and we passed it all the way through until the bottom surface of the domain. But what we've done with this approach is only use an O-grid in the cylindrical pipe itself. So you'll notice this bottom face of the O-grid is offset and it's diagonally upwards from the aperture of the pipe itself. So only this pipe has an O-grid within it and then the outer O-grid is still around the outside of the pipe and passes all the way through the domain. So that's the subtle slight difference here, having the O-grid stop at the aperture of the pipe rather than passing through the entire domain. And what effect does this have on the mesh? Well, of course, from the outside, it looks exactly the same. We can't really tell any difference between that approach and the previous approach. But let's look at the cross section of the domain itself and see where the difference is. Now, straight away here from the cross section, you can see the difference that that different blocking structure is having. You can see that those high aspect ratio cells that are on the wall of the cylinder pass along the wall, and then instead of going through the domain, they now wrap around the aperture of the cylinder and then go back up the other side. And the high aspect ratio cells on the top wall of our domain just pass all the way through. And the net effect of this blocking structure, so having the O-grid only fill this top pipe, as you can see, we don't have any high aspect ratio cells passing through the domain anymore. We have a slight change uh, in size. There's a slight volume transition here between the cells outside and the cells inside, but that's fine for the CFD solver. That's really manageable. The key is that we've stopped those high aspect ratio cells from passing through the domain. Now, this approach is an improvement on the previous one we, we did. But of course, most of you will notice that we haven't fully solved the problem because we've still got high aspect ratio cells passing across the aperture of the pipe. And we know physically the flow is going to be going this way, either up or down through the aperture of the pipe. It's either going to be going upwards if that's an outlet or it's going to be going downwards if that's an inlet. So we're going to be having flow going normal to the thin axis of those high aspect ratio cells. So we've made a slight improvement, but we're not fully there. Again, we need to adjust the blocking structure slightly if we want to get over this problem of the high aspect ratio cells in the aperture. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next section. So for our third example, once again, the outside of the domain looks very similar to the other two examples, and it's almost indistinguishable. We've got the refinement normal to the top surface of the domain, and we've got a cylindrical uh, O-grid on our cylinder here, which is gonna pass into the domain. So from the outside, once again, the mesh looks almost identical. And once again, as a block structured approach, we're using all hexahedral cells. So all three of these examples that I've shown you so far, at first glance, 
look the same and might be judged as being as e of equal quality. But once again, it's really important that we actually look at the blocking structure itself and we can see the significant differences between them. So let's do that. Let's turn on the blocking structure for this final example and see where the differences are. Once again, we start with the O-grid structure at the top and pass that O-grid through the cylindrical inlet. But this time, rather than having the O-grid pass all the way through the domain or having it stop above the aperture of the cylinder, we've taken that surface that in the previous example was offset upwards into the cylinder and we've brought it downwards instead. And you can see there from the blocking lines that that central surface, we've pulled that, that block face downwards underneath the aperture of the cylinder. And then the key with this example is that we've then grown new block faces off that angled surface and had them grow outwards from the cylinder. So a way to think of this is imagine you're standing at the top of the domain here and you're gonna follow down the length of this outside block. You're gonna go down the length of this cylinder and in the first example, you would then carry all the way through the domain. In the second example, you would have gone across and then back up again. But in this third example, you travel down the outside of the cylinder and then you move outwards and then along the top of the domain. So this blocking structure is a little bit more involved. It takes a little bit more time for you to set up. And on the outside of the domain, you can't necessarily see any of the improvement. But once again, the key for us, after having understood the blocking structure, is to turn on a cutting plane and we can look at the mesh structure on the inside and see how much of an improvement we get with this approach. Now, once again, we've got our high aspect ratio, thin cells on the walls of our cylinder coming down. And we've also got our high aspect ratio cells on the top surface of our domain. But now, rather than having those high aspect ratio cells pass through the domain here or pass across the aperture, you can see that the high aspect ratio cells wrap around the corner. They go round here, and this is the edge of the block. You can see it comes down, and that line is the end of the block, and it comes around the corner and then wraps onto the top surface. So this blocking structure is significantly better. We don't have high aspect ratio cells in the bulk of our flow. And we have made some small sacrifice to get here. You can see that these cells are starting to get skewed on the corner here. So we do have some skewness in those cells, and there will be a fairly significant non-orthogonal correction. But that correction, as you can see from this structure, is only going to be localized to these few cells around the corner. And actually for the remainder of the domain, you can see we've got really high quality cells with good transitions between them, both in volume and in orthogonality. So the non-orthogonal correction for the majority of the mesh is going to be relatively small. We've only got a small correction in the vicinity of the corners. And of course, if you were doing this for real, you could optimize this by moving around this blocking edge to try and minimize the degree of non-orthogonality between the cells. And that's what most of the time you'd be recommended to do. So this blocking structure, as you can see, has given us a significant improvement over the previous two. And from the outside, it looks like they're the same. And you might be tricked into thinking that just because you're using a hex block structured mesh, that your mesh was the best quality that it could be. And I'm hoping from this section that you can see that it really depends actually on the blocking structure that you use and putting a cross section through the mesh to see where those high aspect ratio cells go. Now, of course, a block structured approach is a bit of a luxury and is generally only something you can use for more simplified geometries where you can use this blocking approach. For more general geometries, of course, you'd have to use an unstructured approach of some kind. And what I'm gonna show you in the next section is how we'd use the same, we'd mesh the same geometry, but if we were using an unstructured approach, because for some reason the rest of our domain forced us into using an unstructured approach and this inlet or outlet to the domain was just connected to the rest. So let's jump into the next section and I'll show you how this looks when we use an unstructured approach instead.
Now let's have a look at a typical unstructured meshing approach. You can tell that this approach is an unstructured meshing approach straight away because you can see on the surface mesh that there are triangles involved and generally the surface mesh doesn't have a regular structure of squares and quadrilateral cells. So you can tell straight away this is an unstructured mesh and generally we have some increased refinement of the surface mesh as we get towards uh, the cylinder. And then the method that we use to control the resolution of the mesh normal to the wall for the to capture the boundary layer is to use inflation layers. And for the inflation layers in this example problem, I've colored them in red so that you can clearly see the difference between the layers in red and the volume mesh which fills the remainder of the domain. Now the layers are created first. They're usually grown from the surface mesh by projecting that surface mesh into the flow and then the volume mesh is created afterwards to fill the gap. And this approach is a lot more flexible than a block structured mesh approach uh, because we can fit a surface mesh and grow inflation layers from a more general geometry by using triangles in certain places. Now just from looking at this mesh from the outside once again we can't really tell the quality of the mesh and how well it's done. What we need to do as normal is we need to take a slice through the mesh so we can actually look at that mesh structure as it goes around the corner. So let's put a slice through the mesh and then let's zoom in to have a look at the mesh structure. And what I want to do is assess this mesh in the same manner that we assessed the hexablocking meshes from before. The first thing that you can see, which is really nice, is the inflation layers uh, are wrapped around the corner of the aperture of the pipe. So they're, they're grown off the surface of the pipe and then they wrap around the corner to go along the top surface of the domain. We don't have the layers continuing across the bulk of the flow or across the aperture of the pipe, which we saw in the previous examples and what we want to avoid. So straight away, this is looking really good. You could imagine a situation where we used a different unstructured meshing approach where perhaps we might have continued the layers across the aperture here and we could have wrapped the layers from this pipe around the aperture and then back up the other side. And if we did that, we'd be generating those high aspect ratio cells uh, with a thin axis normal to the flow direction. And as we saw before, we really don't want to do that. So this mesh is looking really, really good. We've wrapped the layers around the corner and we don't have uh, thin high aspect ratio cells going through the bulk of the flow. And another thing that's really nice about this slice through the mesh is you can really see what's happening with the mesh structure. And with an unstructured mesh, everything starts from the surface mesh and the surface mesh is often the part that's ignored in the unstructured mesh. What you can see is that in this case with the surface mesh on the top surface of our domain, we have quite large cells far away from the pipe and these cells are effectively projected off the wall into the flow and they're grown normal to the wall. And then once we reach the top of the layers or the top cap, we have either uh, a pyramid, a tetrahedral cell or a polyhedral cell, which is grown from the top face of the layers. So effectively what we're doing here is projecting that face into the flow and using that to grow a cell. And this is really what's going to affect the ultimate quality of this meshing approach. It's the choice of the surface mesh and how it's projected into the flow. And you can see that here, far away from the corners, we have quite large cells. And when these are projected off the wall, that's a quite a large uh, base for the pyramid. And we have a nice regular pyramid or tetrahedral cell there. And this will have quite high quality. Now, the difficulty with the unstructured meshes that people often forget about is we get the poor quality cells in the corner. And what's happening here, you can see as you zoom in, that we've refined the surface mesh as we're going close to the corner. And then those smaller cells are projected off the surface into the flow. And what we can see here is that that thin length here is becoming the base of the pyramid or the tetrahedral cell. And in this case, we have quite a high aspect ratio pyramid or tetrahedral cell. It's got a, a narrow base and a sharp peak. And this isn't really what we want to see. We want to see more of a regular pyramid as we saw further along uh, the volume. 
And actually, the other thing that's often forgotten is if we rotate the mesh and look in 3D, we can get an even better understanding of what's happening to the layers in the corner. And I want you to really zoom in and think about what's happening on the surface mesh and how that's affecting the layers and the base that's used to create the pyramid. You can see that the way this surface mesh has been refined is similar to the way you might refine a hex blocking mesh. You can see that the cells are getting thinner and thinner, they're getting higher and higher aspect ratio, so we're only really refining in one direction. And by the time we get to the corner, you can see that actually we have a very long, thin cell. And that cell is projected off the surface, and you can see these layers, that by the time we reach the end of the layers, the face, the end face of that layer that becomes the base of our pyramid, has a really long, high aspect ratio surface. So there's gonna be a really poor quality pyramid or tetrahedra that's generated off the end face of these uh, layers, which is ultimately going to lead to poor cell quality because we don't have a lot of degrees of freedom of the apex of that pyramid and where we can move it. So this is something that's often forgotten when creating unstructured meshes, is that the layers are gonna be generated from the surface mesh and actually the type of surface mesh that we need to use is actually different to the surface mesh that we might be used to looking at when we think of hexablock approaches. So what I'm gonna show you in the next section is how we can use this same unstructured meshing approach with layers wrapped around the corner, not going across the aperture, but how if we use a different type of surface mesh, we can actually get better layers for our pyramids and our tetrahedral cells to grow off into the core of the flow. Now let's look at a subtle change to the surface mesh for our unstructured meshing approach and see how this slight tweak can improve the mesh significantly. Now, if you look at the surface mesh, you can see that the majority of the surface mesh has the same structure and size that we saw in the previous example, but what I really want you to focus on is the refinement around the, around the outside of the cylinder and how this is different to the previous example. If we zoom in, what you can see is that the cells do indeed get smaller as they approach the cylinder. However, they're not merely being refined along a single axis. And actually what I've used here is a series of triangles to shrink the cells. And so as we approach the edge of the cylinder, we actually still have square cells around the outside of the cylinder. It may take you a little while to see the difference here, but notice that we've got those really small squares coming up to the cylinder rather than those high aspect ratio rectangles. So this is a really small local change that I've made to the surface mesh on the outside of the cylinder, but now let's see how that effect propagates through to the layers and to the volume mesh. So if we put on the cutting plane, and then look normal to the mesh, again, the meshing structure looks very similar to the previous example. When we're far away from the cylinder, we can see we have these uh, large square and triangular cells that are grown away from the surface, and then we have a nice wide base for our pyramid and our tetrahedral transition here. And we have our hex core, and the layers don't travel through the thickness of the domain, so we aren't getting any flow coming across thin high aspect ratio cells. But what about in the corner? Well, actually, from this 2D view, we can't really see much difference. Again, the cells are getting smaller as they approach the corner, and then as those cells are projected off the surface through the layers, that thin axis there forms the base of our pyramid and our tetrahedral cells. And we have some local refinement of the hex core around the layers to capture this. So in 2D, again, this example looks almost identical to the previous example, but let's turn the mesh and look in 3D and have a look at what effect this is having on the layers themselves. Now, if I zoom into the corner, you can really see the effect that this is happening. So the cells are being refined as we get closer to the cylinder. But as the cells approach the cylinder, they're still squares. They have almost got an aspect ratio of one. 
So you can see that as those cells are projected off the surface through layers, the end layer, the final face, the top cap of that layer is now almost a perfect square. So rather than being a long rectangle, it's almost a perfect square. So we have that nice base for the pyramid or the tetrahedra or the polyhedra to grow from. And that gives a lot more degrees of freedom because you can move the apex of that pyramid a large distance to give you a better quality cells and a better transition. So hopefully you can see how that small effect of changing the surface mesh changes the layers, which then changes the base of the pyramid, which will ultimately have better quality cells as your layers turn the corner to go up into the aperture of the pipe. And I've only shown this for a simple example, but you can clearly see how you can use this idea for other bends and transitions for your internal flow problems. Now, before I finish off the talk, I just want to talk briefly about mixed meshing approaches. Now, there may be some flow scenarios where you have a very complex domain with lots of features inside, and you'll be forced to use an unstructured mesh inside your domain of interest. However, your pipe section, you may have a very long section of pipe, and this is typical of some industrial applications that have large and complex ducting and piping systems, and actually, for these regions, these regions of the mesh are relatively simple. And by using this unstructured approach, we're actually creating a lot of extra cells in our mesh. And as we saw from the previous uh, meshing example that I went through of the simple pipe bend, we don't really want to use an unstructured approach unless we have to. And so the perfect solution to this is to use a mixed meshing approach where we have an unstructured mesh in the bulk of our domain and then our duct or our piping systems that are very simple, we use a structured approach or a mapped approach through those. Now this mixed meshing approach uh, can only be accomplished by some meshing software because the important thing in a mixed meshing approach, as I'm gonna show you, is actually the transition between the unstructured and the structured regions, particularly when we have layers involved. So here we are with the mixed meshing approach. Straight away, by looking at the mesh, you can see that the bottom section of the domain, which is connected to our larger domain and may have our complex flow features, we have the unstructured meshing approach, where we've got the layers on the top, which go around the aperture of the pipe and into the pipe itself. They don't go across the aperture or through the thickness of the domain. But then at the top, rather than having the layers and the unstructured region carry on through our complex pipe or ducting system, we've replaced it with, an, with a completely structured approach. So all of the pyramids and the polyhedra and the transition to the bulk of the flow are gone. And we've got this really efficient, high quality structured meshing approach. Now, what's the key with this mixed meshing approach? The key is the transition in the layers. And if we zoom in, what you can see is that the layers from the unstructured region match exactly with the either the blocking edge or the mapped edges of the cells in the structured region. So you can see that there's a continuation of the layers on both sides. And of course we have generated some uh, tetrahedra and pyramids here to transition off the end faces of the central core into the hex core region here. But once again, going right back to the start of the video, the important thing is that we don't have thin high aspect ratio cells normal to the flow direction because we know the flow is going to be either going up or down through this pipe. And the important thing is that we haven't carried the layers across the end and back down. So the flow, it comes along and it will see uh, a very regular tetrahedra or pyramid cell there, uh, a cube and then a larger cube into the hex core and the same way going up into the structured region here. So if you do try to use a mixed meshing approach for an application like this or something similar, the main thing is to really focus on the transition between the layers and to make sure that your layers are continuing throughout the domain and you're not chopping them across through the bulk of the flow. And that will give you ultimately better convergence behavior uh, for your CFD simulation. So I'm hoping that by the end of this, what you can really see is that actually a lot of the art of meshing comes down to controlling your layers and the path of your layers.
So regardless of whether you're using a structured, an unstructured approach, or even a mixed meshing approach, the key is to focus on the path of the layers and having a plan for where the layers are going to grow, go and how you're going to help them as they go round corners and transition between different regions of the mesh. So that brings me to the end of the video. I know that these meshing style videos are very different to the uh, presentation and lecture style videos that I've been doing in the past. So please let me know in the comment section. Are you enjoying this, these types of videos? Are you finding them useful for your own meshing? Because if they are and I receive good feedback from these type of videos, then I could consider making more meshing style videos in the future if I know it's being very helpful for you guys. So yeah, let me know in the comment section. And before I quickly wrap up, I wanted to say thank you all very much for watching and continuing to support my work and support the channel. I really do appreciate it and it makes putting all these videos together worthwhile. I also want to thank Beta CAE Systems for providing me with the license to use Answer. It's because of them that I'm able to bring you uh, meshing content with real software and showing you real meshes. So a big thank you to Beta CA Systems as well for allowing me to put together uh, this video. So thank you all very much and I'll see you in the next video.